our next panel will be on catalysts and change makers, the growth of the entrepreneur with Alexander Mastrovito, the head of sustainability at Scania, as our moderator. This session is also supported by the Swedish, Ch Swedish Chamber of Commerce in Hong Kong. Thank you for your support and promotions that you've done for us. Please welcome Alexander and the speakers. Okay, very good. So, um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and very welcome to this panel uh, that we call Catalysts and Changemakers, the growth of the entrepreneur. So, what will, we what will we discuss here today? Basically, we want to explore how organizations, and we have three fantastic organizations represented on stage here today, how they can create environments within their own organizations in order to spur innovation, in order to find the change makers that can create this innovation and how that can lead them to become more sustainable. And I believe that in your app, you have all the information that you need on these three uh, fantastic speakers, but I just want to uh, introduce them once again. And with us, we have uh, Rebecca Cho Jung, you're the co-founder of Dream Impact, Education for Good. And then we have Martin Daphner, a senior vice president of strategy and business practices at the Fun Group. And then finally, we have Michael, who needs no introduction because, you know, he just held this fantastic speech before. Please join me in giving a hand for the panelists. So, um, in order to delve into this topic on how to spur innovation, how to create change from within, I wanted to start by discussing it from an organizatorial perspective, from a management, man, management perspective. And I wanted to pitch the first question to you, Michael, because SAP is an incredibly large organization. It's heavily dependent on management systems, systems and processes. And Basically, how does one get to that stage where you have built up an organization with the processes in place that can yeah, basically induce the organization to innovate and create solutions for problems that aren't really there at the moment but will be important in the future? Uh, thank you, Alexander. Um, yeah, I mean, SAP is a, is a slightly different case, perhaps, because we're in the technology industry, in the software development industry. And so, you know, innovation has to be the, the heartbeat and the, the, the network, the sort of the blood system of our organization, or we're just not going to last very long, right? So um, innovation from day one has always been, been key. I think the, the way we would look at the, the systems to make sure that innovation remains a high priority and an effective functioning system within that is you have the, 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 the soft side of the business, which is sort of the leadership and the culture that promotes innovation. And then you have the formal systems around uh, team structures, accountability, and KPIs around innovation as well. And I think that's what's important there is, uh, is that we have to remain customer focused and customer requirement focused and so it's, it's not just on the developer teams and, and around teams hitting their milestones around that, but it's bringing in those customer requirements, customer insights from the field. And so a lot of our, uh, you know, we have formal systems around our sales account executives, uh, our um, services and consulting teams, as they're daily engaging with customers, is to bring those insights back into the developer team and to make sure that uh, those insights then are prioritized and reviewed on, a, on an ongoing basis. So I, want, I won't talk too much now about the softer side. Maybe we'll talk about it a bit. But I think those are the formal systems that are important to maintain that sense of innovation. 
quick question then. Formal or informal systems, which one do you th see is more effective at the uh, at it, present? They're both absolutely vital, and it's a yin-yang situation. You can't have one without the other. Good. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think we'll get to this more later on. Um, let me then throw a question to you, Martin. Um, and while, while Michael mentioned about the systems that we build, but the system is one thing. Then you also have the individuals, the individuals that can spark change, the change makers, as we call them in this in this session. Basically, how do you how do you in a large organization how do you identify these people? How do you identify an individual with a with a spark for innovation and change? Yeah. So that this is a it's a great question because that's that's key to success no matter what sort of hardware you've got in place or, or, or the soft system. Um, so I, having had an opportunity to do this at a, quite a few different companies, I, I, I have a point of view <laughs> on, on this, um, that you don't need everyone to participate in this at the same level. Uh, at Procter & Gamble, where I started my career, we used to say that you, if you've got about 20 to 25 percent of your, your entire employee pool it, it has the passion for, for change, has the passion for innovation, that's all you need. And in fact, you don't want too much more than that, or, or the wheels will fall off the core business cart that has to keep moving. Uh, so the, now the question becomes, how do you find them? And, and the answer to that depends on the corporate culture. I suppose. If you're a software as a service company, you'll find them in a different way than you would at a, at a company like Lee and Fung, which is predominantly a sourcing trading business. Uh, but I think it, the important message is find a way to find them. Uh, I can offer a, as, a, as one possible way a great tool uh, that, that you can find online called Creatrix, which is a simple online profiling tool. Uh, it's minimum cost to implement, and it does a wonderful, it's the only tool I've seen out there that's statistically uh, proven, let's say, you can, there's actually some decent stats on it that it works to identify these people. So that's one way, but, but uh, there are many ways to, to do the self-selection. Is that how you do it in your organization? We did do it at at, at, uh, at Lee and Fung. We have, and I've I've used it at, at Procter and Gamble and at Avery Dennison. I've used it at a couple different companies. Uh, self selection is another great tool. It provide opportunities. Some of the other uh, panels we heard today were were telling stories about the opportunities that they provide for people to participate. Wonderful way to identify. Good. Thank you very much. Um, then to you, Rebecca. I mean. Your organization, which is an, an NGO, basically, and you work with educating other organizations on how to create these innovative systems, how to create uh, an environment conducive to change. How, how do you do that? Well, uh, actually, I'm a business entrepreneur turned social entrepreneur myself. So since then, I have set up different platforms and social enterprises to, uh, to build the social innovation movement here in Hong Kong. Uh, it's not easy because first we need to look for a group of passionate people uh, and also we need to identify what is at stake here, what is the issue, be it social, environmental, poverty alleviation. So there must be a pain point. So even in the business world, I, I suppose in the corporate world, uh, each company has different pain points. Then you, you need to see what you'd like to solve. Uh, and then in the social enterprise circle, we always uh, put focus on new ideas, how to generate them. Um, we, do, we focus on learning, on testing, because it's not easy to find one solution. A solution is a process. During the process, we need to do a lot of uh, idea iteration. We need to do a lot of focus group studies, talk to people. For example, in the business world, we talk to our clients and see what are their real needs, their pain points are. And then we come up with certain solutions, but these solutions may not be perfect. We need to test them uh, and then redefine the, the problem, redefine the solution, work on them again. So really, it's a long process until you may come up with something that is possibly uh, can solve the problem that you, you are trying to, to solve. Good. And 
hearing from Michael and Martin about their experiences in their organizations, would you say that those experiences are representative for most of the organizations you see, or do you see organizations working quite differently from theirs? Uh, I think for well-established organizations, they may have systems already in place, and very important is uh, the corporate culture uh, may be fixed at a certain level. Um, so that is why it is important if we could have entrepreneurs. Well, basically entrepreneurs, they would put the entrepreneurial mindset in the corporate. And also they would help to set up the process, the system. So um, if we have more entrepreneurs trying to do things within the corporate, I think they, they could uh, point to new ways of thinking. Uh, they could ignite the passion in the staff and also uh, they would as actually accelerate growth within the corporations. But again, this is not easy. It's easier said than done. But I think uh, you, you need to look for passionate people who would like to do this within the company. Good. So basically, uh, innovative processes are not just for large corporations. It's for everybody, right? Yeah, I think the same with uh, small corporations. But for small corporations, it's easier for them to turn around uh, because uh, everything would be simpler. But then for big corporations like SAP and Fong, because you have thousands of employers, uh, employees, and then you have the suppliers. So you have to look at the supply chain itself. Um, so it, it is not easy to, to do with multinational companies. Good. Thank you very much. So, Having looked a little bit in a, into more traditional innovation processes and identification of change makers, the point behind this session is to explore how these processes that can then apply to the sustainability challenges that we now face. So, Martin, let me go to you then, and because Fun Group, you. Textiles is, one, is your main business, basically, right? And this is one of the industries on the planet that has the largest environmental impact. How have you leveraged the traditional work with innovation and change and applied it to the industries that you are in? So I'm going to go back to a couple of things I've heard earlier in the, in the morning session from a few folks, uh, a couple of key themes, one around collaboration outside the walls of the firm. Uh, I, I think that's key for, for, for us at, at Fung. Um, uh, the, the other key theme I've heard is around ex experimentation. Um, and then finally, I'll tie it back to something I mentioned a moment ago, which is finding those people that are passionate, right? Finding those, those self-selecting entrepreneurs. Um, the role specifically that Fung plays, let me get real pragmatic uh, to answer the question, how do we help with sustainability and how do the leaders at Fung think about helping with sustainability um, is really w one of a, a facilitator uh, and, a, and a technology enabler. So we work with a lot of garment factories, we work with fabric mills, I'm going to particularly pick on denim because denim is a bad actor in the sustainability world in our industry. In the garment industry, it's probably the worst actor from a sustainability perspective. The, no, <laughs> okay. Construction, well, in, in, in garments, in, in garment production. And, and it's, the, it's the washing and treatment and, and manufacture of denim that that's really uh, creates a lot of not so nice stuff that gets dumped into, into the environment. So uh, helping to support the experimentation on alternate technologies. I can give an example around laser etching blue jeans. Instead of acid washing blue jeans, that treatment can be facilitated through uh, alternate technologies that don't generate nearly as much bad stuff for the environment. And, and our role is identifying that technology, understanding it well enough to understand what, it's, what it does well and what it doesn't do well, and connecting players. And, and it's, that makes it sound easy, but it's actually quite difficult. You still have the trade-off discussion that you have to have about all the existing infrastructure that the companies have to, to do the old tech. And what are they going to do with that? And how much is it going to cost to implement this new tech? And how quickly will it be adapted? And will their customers be willing to buy it? Uh, it takes passionate people to persevere through that, uh, uh, that conversation. And, and I, I like Michael's, one of your key themes, that business is the only place where we can scale the impact of this. 
it's got to, we've got to do it within large businesses like the Fung Group to, to help carry this thing forward enough to where it can be scalable profitably. So that's the role that we play, trying to make sure this thing gets a few steps down, down the path to where others see the benefit of picking up the ball and running with it. And just picking up on one thing there, because you work, as you mentioned, with a lot of suppliers, tier one, tier two, garment factories, and then in the, in the ne next step, the textile mills. Is it possible for you guys to move this innovative thinking and, su and, and sustainability thinking and change making into those suppliers of yours as well? Or are you, um, let's say, are you working strictly within your own organization or are you pushing it out? Um, Martin. Just a follow-up question. Yeah, no, we're, we're, we're definitely working more towards pushing it out, uh, to, to give a, a, a short answer. We, w there's a bit of work that has to be done internally um, before I think it's ready to, to be handed to someone else, but we, we can't make it happen by ourselves, right? We can't scale it. So it, it's, a, it's got to be done in collaboration with folks if it's mm. going to have an impact. Good. Thank you. So back to you, Michael, then. And um, I mean, you showed us a few good examples in your presentation, but um, <clears throat> when we're talking about, you have traditionally been a company focusing on innovation, but how do you, uh, let's say, change the innovation process in order to cater for the sustainability issues that you see right now? Can you leverage the exact same processes or do they need to be changed? Can they work within the framework of the traditional, um, let's say, um, business objectives of your organization or do you need new objectives? Well, there's two answers there. The first one is that, as I said before, you know, we have to be uh, very much have our, our finger on the pulse of what our customers are looking for and, and innovate against that. And th in the macro context, sustainability is becoming vitally important to all of them across industries. Uh, and so that feedback coming from what our customer requirements are, are becoming very clear that they need and want more sustainability metrics built into our core products. So as I said, we're launching uh, carbon accounting, we're launching uh, uh, cloud and analytics products that are gonna help them with materials management, and this is in direct response to their needs and requirements. So that's on the, on the more formal product innovation side. I think another way that both large and small companies can innovate in new and creative ways against sustainability objectives. Uh, it, you know, one example we have at SAP is a program that we call One Billion Lives. And this is our signature intrapreneurship program. It's global, it's company-wide. It's sponsored by one of our uh, global board members. And the very simple objective is over a set period of time, it has some, some guide rails around the program. It just puts out an objective. All of you employees are open to join the One Billion Lives program on an annual basis. You can self-assemble your teams and you generate innovative solutions against sustainability solutions. And those could be governance, those could be in, you know, social uh, issues, they could be environmental issues. And this is now, I think, in its third year, and every year is seeing more and more participation, more and more sophistication in the solutions, and interestingly, more and more cross-department or cross-functional participation as people learn that these solutions have to be systems-based, they have to bring in a commercial element, they have to bring in a technology element and a bring in a market context element. And so we're seeing a lot of these solutions solve issues like, uh, you know, creating more effective cancer treatments for people in India, the, uh, helping uh, emergency response relief against natural disasters, um, you know, helping set out to eliminate child labor in certain markets, right? So they're really 
very focused, and, and I think that helps in terms of, of their effectiveness. And then we have a, a, a global review process, you know, starting at the local market or the regional level, and then they graduate to a global judging process. And then the, the, um, the, the finalists, uh, the teams are then given the permission, the, the funding, and the time to further develop and commercialize these solutions. And they go, whether they, they go to Silicon Valley or go to Germany for, for effective development and support. This is, uh, to me, just a, a perfect example of an entrepreneurship platform. Good. Can I make a remark? Of uh, course. Following up on Michael's example, this is a great example of entrepreneurship mm. within such a big organization. And I think this is how innovation comes in because uh, I think entrepreneurship and innovation are tied together. You can't have just entrepreneurship. But then when you have innovation, constant innovation coming in, uh, people, are will, uh, people, are, people dare to think, they dare to lead. They dare to create new things. And this is very important, I think, especially under times like this, when we're facing economic downturn and a lot of challenges. Uh, we really need to put our brains together and also to need the passion within our, our colleagues. And I think this is a great way of retaining staff and also encouraging leadership at different levels of the company. Yeah. So maybe uh, we, we continue talking with you, Rebecca, anyways. Um, how do you find this process, having done this for a while, but perhaps, and always had a social and sustainable focus on your business, but how do you find adapting traditional uh, innovation processes and, and, um, and the education that you do to a new environment where sustainability is coming more into focus? For example, at uh, Dream Impact, which is basically a co-working space. So we bring together around 70 social organizations. Uh, many of them are startups. So they have different ways of improving the environment. For example, we have uh, a non-resident partner called Luna. They are using organic cotton uh, for sanitary towers for women. And so they're producing it now and trying to save the environment and let people know about the consequences of waste uh, and also um, those uh, materials that are toxic to the environment. So it's very new initiatives. So we are working together to support them and also to reiterate uh, the whole idea of them. So we have events, activities that we uh, formulate with our resident partners. We call them partners, not members, because basically to Dream Impact, all these organizations are our partners. We grow together as a community, as an impact community. So um, this is not easy because they may have a lot of failures. But when we say failures, it, it's not the end of the world. It just leads us to another process to improve on what we have been doing. Uh, and also, uh, we, were, we are bridging corporate and social organizations together because I, I think the world has come to a point when we see that social enterprises, they have good social mission, they are doing good things, but they are not, a, they are not silo. They don't exist alone. They have to exist together with business corporations because I think corporations has a lot to offer in terms of our understanding of the market, in terms of our professional knowledge. So if social enterprises and business enterprises could work together or make use of each other's skills and talents, then they could create better solutions as well. And I also think that for social enterprises to succeed, as Michael mentioned, you have the 5% procurement policy, which you're making use of products and services from social enterprises. And this is a great example of collaboration between social and business enterprises. Well, to me, in the very long run, I would envision a society where we don't have social enterprises anymore, just business with social mission, business with purpose. Good, thank you. So, a question for all three of you. First of all, and, and just yes and no will be fine. Do you, first of all, do you have sustainability KPIs that you work for towards in your organization? Just raise your hand if you have. Yes, okay, two of you. Do you have financial incentives connected to those KPIs? 
Okay, so then the follow-up question is, do you think this is needed in order to spur this innovation? Do you think you will have to adopt a more traditional way of incentivizing your workforce in order to drive towards these targets? Open question to any, anyone. Yeah, I mean, I think if we're going to drive sustainability performance deep into the, uh, the, the core business performance assessment and and reward mechanism for leadership and employees so that it creates a virtuous circle, then we're going to have to implement those kind of KPIs. But in order to get the KPIs, you have to have the measurement mechanisms that work effectively. And that's what I was saying earlier about things like the Value Balancing Alliance, things like uh, effective impact assessments in your integrated report, for example, which so many companies still uh, are, are lagging on, right? And so if they're, if they're lagging on that, they don't have the raw materials in order to build effective KPIs in the first place. So you need to build that infrastructure and have the mindset to drive it into the business. Good. I completely agree. I think we, we don't have specific financial incentives around a KPI, but our customers are asking us, make sure, how do I know that, that I'm sourcing from a sustainable player, you know, a, a responsible, a socially responsible player. We struggle to answer that question. We, we have the financial incentive that the customer's asking us to make sure we're doing it right, right? Or make sure this factory, this mill, is, is, but we don't necessarily know how to answer that question the right way. Uh, so the infrastructure is our biggest challenge right now, frankly. We have incentives because our customers are asking for it. Good. And I didn't mean to ambush, ambush anybody, and so I'll, full disclosure, we also have, we have the KPIs, but no incentives yet as well in our organization, so yeah. Anyways, um, I think we will uh, take a few uh, questions from the audience, and um, I, let me start with the first one from um, Anna Jan, Jan, who's asking, so how can you be a change maker in an organization when you don't have support from senior management? How to kind of, how, how can you build support bottom-up? Fantastic question. Um, I think you have to, first of all, assess yourself and take the time to really understand what it is that's driving you. Um, and if, if it's improving your position within the company, is it delivering on your own value system? And both of those have enormous power, you know, to carry you forward because you will inevitably run into obstacles and challenges and you need to understand what is fueling you. Um, so I would say that, that, you know, being very, very clear about that and reinforcing and reiterating that to yourself is probably the first step that you need to get right and keep that active. Um, I, I think building those coalitions and collaborations within and outside your company is a great thing and, and being able to demonstrate that in a clearly articulated business case to your, your manager, your, your company leadership is important. Is not to, not to cast your ambition as a, this is what I'd like to do, you know, because they've hired you to do something for the company. If it can advance the company's goals or you can help associate what your ambition is and how it will help the company, that's certainly going to, uh, to open and pave the way for you to, to move in the direction that you want to move. Yeah, if I can just build on that. I, as an entrepreneur uh, and someone who coaches entrepreneurs, if you will, um, we, I often come up uh, to this question, come up with, I, I, I run into this, and it, it's, a, it's a mindset change for the entrepreneur. Because if, if, you're, if you're asking, uh, this might sound a little brutal, but if you're saying, how can I operate, how can I drive change when they don't get it? That's a little bit like an entrepreneur saying, how can I sell this when my customer doesn't get it? <laughs> no, no successful entrepreneur would ever ask that question, right? You have to help the customer see what's in it for them. If you want to be a successful entrepreneur, you've got to help leadership see what you see. And that's not easy, that's not trivial, but I would say to, to the person who asked the question, ask yourself that question, what's in it for them? And, and how can I help them see that? 
And, and if you want to do this a lot in your career, if you want to drive change a lot, you're going to need to get good at helping people see what's in it for them. Whether you're an entrepreneur or an entrepreneur, if you want, if that's your passion, go get good at that skill. Invest in getting good at that skill. Otherwise, you're, you're just going to be frustrated. Follow up then for you, Rebecca, because you work with the bottom-up tactic from the beginning. You work with people, uh, getting them more innovative. Do you, is, is management support crucial for this to work in your experience? Yeah. I think all kinds of innovation always come from the bottom. Of course, there, there are innovations coming from the top. But if those are coming from the bottom, they will un th these people understand the problem much better than those at the bottom as well. So uh, I don't think it, it's a matter of whether you are at the lower tier of the organization or the top tier of the organization. As long as you understand what the problem is about, for example, for social enterprises, we have to define the social problem. Is this what people want? And are there any uh, problems underneath that we are not aware of? So I think whenever we put forward any new ideas, uh, to make the management buy the idea, we have to let them know this is the crux of the problem. And then uh, give them a, a clear narration of what you'd like to do, what the solutions will be. And I think there's no point in doing a small MVP, a minimal viable product, just a trial uh, or a pilot to see whether the innovation can really take off. So I think for top management, they should be flexible enough to allow uh, people from the, from the bottom to try out new things, perhaps on a small scale first. Okay, very good. And uh, unfortunately, we have run out of time now. So everybody, please join me in thanking our eminent panelists for this time. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Alexander, and our speakers for the stimulating discussion. Mm -hmm.